Hello and good day, everybody. How are you? It is Thursday, a.k.a. Dolphins Bengals Game Day. Um, please excuse the static in my mic. We are still can't find the short, uh, but we are trying to work through it. What's going on? Kevin P. West. How you doing, buddy? Ice Wolf. Gentleman Built. What is up? What is up? Oh, goodness gracious. So, uh, today we have a, uh, the, the, Kevin, I will tell you, you are right. I was thinking the same thing. I watched the warmups cause obviously I'm live now and oh boy, are the, uh, the Siberian tiger uniforms for the Bengals. Awesome. But I am not here to talk about the amazing fashion sense that is Cincinnati. I am here to talk with um, a brand new artist that not many people have heard of. Somebody that is just inching his way uh, into the professional scene uh, and is is completely unknown to, to almost everybody uh, but his immediate family. Um, somebody that we are happy to feature so that he can get a little bit of exposure uh, from the hit-making machine that is DCD Collects. Uh, and that gentleman is our good friend, uh, Lee Cozy. What's going on, Lee? How you doing? I'm good, man. It's it's good to be seen. Um, what you doing? <laughs> Ooh, interesting. Yeah, I'll have to take a look. What's going on, Brent? How you doing, buddy? Um, so we wanted to kind of talk about, um, what you're doing in a little bit more detail and kind of get, uh, to the process behind it. Uh, but let's first start with, um, what are you doing? All right, so people are saying that they can't hear you. Let me, uh, give me a moment to see if I can pull an extra source here real quick. <laughs> That'd be nice. That'd be fun. Let me see if we can. All right, let me see here. All right, everybody on my screen, how about now?
Can you hear Lee? I can talk about boy Star Wars, so I can talk about that. Yeah. So Kevin's working on the uh, 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 the Star Wars animated project. Same thing I'm working on. Uh, his stuff looks gorgeous, by the way, Kevin. <laughs> but can they hear me? Okay. So now, now they got you. Let me just fix awesome. everything else. Yeah. Now it's working. Sweetness. Sweetness, I was only joking when I started talking. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just suddenly got all emo there. Gonna do some on the fly editing. Peel back the curtain. <laughs> it's a slow reveal. It is. Now let's see if I can get. <laughs> I'm way down here, though. <laughs> well, that's all right. I got. I'm. I'm working on it. <laughs> it's the beauty. Of, the 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 beauty of live video. <laughs> okay so everybody while he's doing that if you're in my stream feel free to uh talk smack about dc yes you can't see it in my chat that's true Please. i would say and vice versa except i can actually see the chat because <laughs> you have it on screen all right, how's this for everybody? I think it uh, it's going to work good enough. Sometimes there's good, and sometimes there's good enough. Sometimes we just got to settle with meh. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I ended up here. <laughs> I'm the one everybody compromised with. Uh, what's going on? Paul Maitland. Paul Maitland art. I have seen some of Paul Maitland's art, and yep, it's delicious. Speaking of delicious, Chef! Chef has been releasing the Bracken, which is a baked Kraken that his students made. Because <laughs> not only is he a chef on the interwebs, he's a chef in real life. See, I didn't know he was a real life chef, because I thought Chef was like what you call it, like your meth dealer or something. <laughs> no, that's that's the cook. That's complete, something completely oh, different. Okay. And something I am not going to get into. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've seen... Uh, I've seen Breaking Bad. I haven't. <laughs> All right. So what they missed was, hey, Lee, what are you doing? Uh, I'm working on a sketch card. So, you know, this uh, crazy, wacky group that I hang out with called DCD Collects uh, asked if I had any Star Wars animated sketch cards. And oh said they would buy them off me if I had them. So I'm I'm doing some Star Wars animated sketch cards. And uh, then what they will do, which is pretty cool, is DCD Collects will then package up all this artwork from all these amazing artists, and they will stick it in a box, a bunch uh, of boxes. Now, you, I, I did reveal last week uh, one of the projects we were working on. Um, would you, if they can't guess... What would you say the general theme uh, is for the, the cards that you've made? Uh, for this one or for the other set? Oh, just what's in front of them. We don't want to give too much away. Oh. Uh, animated Star Wars. Ooh. Wow. So, like, hey, we got a bunch of cartoon stuff from Star Wars. The guy any art that goes with it. We want to curate this. So, which, by the way, is my favorite thing about DCD is they actually curate the stuff. They're not just grabbing random things. They go out and actually hunt down stuff that suits that package. We, we get an idea, 
and then we try to find the style that matches the idea. Mm -hmm. um, now, you said that you are doing sketch cards. What is the difference between a sketch card and an art card? The syllables. Got it. Just kidding. They both sketch and art both have the same number of syllables. Uh, the, uh, the, the number of vowels. Um, nope, still the same. Damn it. Number of consonants. There we go. <laughs> Got it. Good. Third time's a charm. <laughs> Yeah, I'll get it eventually. But uh, yeah, it, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of like I've mentioned it to you before. I like to me, I from a, from a phonetic standpoint, I like the word sketch card. You know, I just I think it sounds fun. It sounds cool, um, but it's bad marketing. Uh, art card tends to be better marketing because this is a sketch. This is not. So you know, it's kind of like. This is a sketched, this is finished art. And I try to make sure I got the camera. There we go. Uh, so, and, and that's really an important distinction when you're doing these cards. So a lot of times nowadays, the cards, they're still called sketch cards or whatever, but they don't accept these as cards. They accept these as cards. And so they'll send this back and say, do more. Uh, but yeah, so, that, so technically, you know, there, there's no actual definition of sketch card versus art card. They're pretty much the exact same thing, but from a marketing standpoint, uh, you know, sketch sounds unfinished or of lesser value, um, whereas art card tends to sound complete. You know, it's it's more effort involved. Um, I just personally hate it because, uh, as I mentioned to you before, it makes me sound like I'm one of those aliens from Mars Attacks. Ah, 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 art card. Ah, ah. It's just it, I hate it and. Uh, so I tend to still call them sketch cards personally, but uh, art card is a much better description. Now, Kevin said he wants to push the envelope even further and say mini masterpieces. Mini masterpieces, cool, because you do have, you know, it, it does kind of have that, that you know, that phonetic going with it. It's alliterative. Mm -hmm. And and I kind of dig that. That's pretty cool. By the way, I just got raided by Tyson Draw Stuff. So uh, Tyson and your crew, if you would, we're actually simulcast uh, streaming with DCD Collects their Twitch stream has a much better video quality. So I would I would check them out. Uh, thank you very much for that raid though, but you guys are really gonna love this. We're talking about the art business uh, of, you know, the art of sketch cards and also the business side of it. And that segues into the business side of it. <laughs> um, now, you are a multi-medium artist. Um, you have a lot of projects that you're allowed to talk about, a lot of projects you're not allowed to talk about, I assume. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure you have stuff, <laughs> especially considering your resume, that is NDA'd. Um, uh, yeah. What is the uh, two-part question? Mm -hmm. What is your favorite subject to work on, and what is your favorite overall medium to do it in, or any medium based on the art that it's attached to. Ooh. What's going on, Hellbolt? So medium, I would have to say it's a toss-up. Um, it, it sort of depends on my mood uh, or also, you know, what the project entails. So I, I do I do kind of think, you know, you use the right tool for the right job. Um, uh, I wasn't expecting that question. Give me one second. I'm, I'm not sure how much of this will fit on camera because this picture is freaking huge. But um, this is a piece I just did for the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. And it's going to be upside down because the bottom of it's where all the cool stuff's going on. But this one, you know, specifically, they were like, ooh, we like the Bernie Wrightson kind of, you know, muted colors and black and white art. So this is what I did for them. Uh, and it's just this giant, massive picture. Uh, of a dude attacking a party in 1920 something. So during the roaring 20s, uh, big demon uprising. But uh, so in that case, the perfect tool for the job, the right, the right hammer was a, a pen and ink. Um, whereas when I'm doing the sketch card stuff, uh, if time is a limiting factor, I'll probably go with pen and ink. Uh, if I can have time to kind of flex my muscles and do what I want, you'll usually get gouache. Um, and if I can do anything I want, I'll switch to oils. So as far as, as far as the medium goes, that's kind of, you know, how it goes. And I've actually got examples of oil painting sketch cards too. 
um, that I can grab here. But uh, kind of, um, but as far as like my personal subject matter, um, I love drawing sci-fi. I love being creative and doing wacky stuff. So character design is always fun. But I will admit that uh, my favorite thing that I will draw if I'm not working on other stuff is going to be dragons, monsters, stuff like that. So this is a this is actually a gouache painted sketch card uh, that I did. And I have wasn't expecting to pull out the oil painted one, so I didn't actually pull those out and have them. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually one of my oil painted sketch cards. No, I mean, uh, that's what, four or $500, something like that? Yeah, these usually, when I sell these, I sell these for like $500. Yeah, I can, I can um, imagine. Um, and then like this one's 500, but that's mostly because the card stock is is super ridiculously rare. I think only four or five, I'm sorry, five or six artists, I think, were the only people who even had access to this card stock. No kidding. And so this is the Star Wars Galactic Files Celebration 4. So also, by the way, a lot of times the value of the card isn't just the art on the card, it's also what card is, what sets it from. So similar to, um, let's let's give an example. Um, let me think here. Similar to like a comic book. All of them might be a, a first issue, but some of them are gonna be on cardstock. Some of them are gonna be like uh, cut out to like the old school 90s chromium. What's going on, Trevor? Um, it's all a matter of, of print run and the same thing with cards. They only print X number of those blank cards and most of them get drawn on at the actual show. Yes. Um, so, sorry, I was, um, people in my chat talking to me and I don't want to talk over to you and I'm just like, <laughs> uh, again, guys, check out the DCD collect stream. Uh, uh, for the people who just raided us, Tyson again, thank you very much for that raid. Um, but yeah, it, it, uh, it, it does really depend because like the, so that Star Wars Galactic Files that I had, the regular cards, uh, those didn't have the celebration label on them. So this is actually, you know, one of those cards, basically it just says Star Wars Galactic Files this is actually series two. And then it, you know, just, Series two, blah, blah, blah. But it's just, it is, this is what was available in the packs. So you could buy, go to Target, you know, and buy a pack of cards and potentially get that. The, uh, that Tuscan though, that I had, that one, the only way you could have got that was you physically had to be at uh, Star Wars Celebration. So here's another one of the Celebration cards I have. But you, you physically actually had to be at Star Wars Celebration and you had to wait in line at the Tops booth at a certain time of day to get this. And so there was only a certain number of these cards were actually even manufactured with this, uh, with this label. And so these of, of these cards of the Star Wars Celebration, or sorry, Star Wars Galactic Files, these are the rarest version of it. So sometimes you'll also have, uh, I've got a couple of other old cards where it's like the backs will be different. So like one had Luke, one had Vader. So one was red, one was blue kind of stuff. Yeah. So the, sometimes even in the same set in the stuff that's coming out in the boxes, they'll even change the backs. And so the backs will make be a limiting factor on them as well. So you mentioned something uh, before that. You mentioned gouache. Now, I mean, I, kn I know everything there is to know, but there are people who don't know what gouache is as a medium. Could you explain to the average person who may not know uh, or have the omnipotent brain uh, what gouache is? Uh, gouache is essentially opaque watercolor. So uh, all paint, regardless of what it is, is basically a binder and a medium. So you have, uh, or I'm sorry, a binder, and which is the medium, and the pigment. And so uh, every paint out there has pigment. And so the pigment's always pretty much the same. The binder is what makes it different. If it's if your binder is oil based, like you know linseed oil, sunflower oil, saffron, saf, you know safflower, whatever oils, uh, uh, walnut oil, that's all oil based paint. If it's gum arabic, it's generally considered watercolor. Gum arabic and uh, pigment is basically watercolor. Gum arabic plus pigment plus more pigment is gouache, and so it has a, a much 
thicker pigment density than watercolor. But if you want to use it like watercolor, like I just did back here, or even on these things, you just add more water, and you know, you create like a wash with it and it becomes watercolor, but it's the exact same thing. So I tend to, I don't even buy watercolor anymore. I only buy gouache because if I want the watercolor effect, like this Yoda here with the background, I wanted a watercolor effect. So I watered it down and then painted in kind of the swampy background. And for the rest of it, where I wanted the opaque effect, it's the exact same paint. I just use less water. Got it. Um, and, and, and I was joking. Actually, somebody had asked me, and I couldn't come up with a really good answer other than it's like watercolor paint. So yeah. I like your answer better than mine. <laughs> yeah, just the, the, it actually, believe it or not, way back in the day, is it was originally called opaque watercolor. Then they called it designer watercolor. Then they called it designer gouache. Then they just started calling it gouache. <laughs> so depending on you know what you know uh, decade slash century you got into it, <laughs> the name changed. Now, when you come up with a a subject that you're going to draw, how do you determine the the pose or the actual content of let's say a commission? Let's say uh, you know one of your many people watching your live stream. Uh, reach out to you for a commission. They say they want, let's go with Princess Leia. Um, let's go with Hoth Leia. How do you determine uh, if they just say, make me a Leia clown, how do you decide how that Leia looks? Um, well, there's two ways. If if somebody wants a a Leia, you know, uh, or it, well, if, they, if they want something straight from the television show. So I was actually kind of prepping here. So this is my cell phone. You can see the card I'm drawing here. I can actually just almost do a thumbnail sketch using the edit feature in my phone. Um, I almost never do that though, so this card changes. That's the image I'm drawing from. So when I'm trying to figure out what I want to put there, I can actually just sit there and kind of move the crop tool around in a basic edit, you know, uh, photo app, and figure out what I want to do. And that's if I'm going to go from something that's basically a screen grab or you know from a television show or from a movie or something. Something I have a photo reference of, uh, I will use that. Uh, Kevin P.S. Okay. says a Leia clown would be very interesting. <laughs> However, if I'm doing something different, so like when we did, if I'm doing something I don't have reference, like exact reference to just copy from. Um, so like when we did the, uh, like a Wolverine set or we do a cartoon set or something like that, I will actually do, uh, I will do thumbnails. Um, uh, do I have the, I just realized that sheet of paper came out while we were talking earlier. <laughs> and I don't know where it went, <laughs> but um, I do have the Deadpool one. So, so I will literally sit down and map out a, a grid like this. You know, uh, usually what I'll do is I will take an actual physical card and I'll just do this. Oops. And I'll just sit there and, and just make a whole bunch of sketch card size, you know, panels on my thing. And then like when we're sitting here trying to figure out Wolverine or whatever, I'll be like, okay, well, I want this. I want the character like this. And I think maybe I want his, his fist up over here, claws out. And so I'll sit there and figure this out. And I'll, I'll do a bunch like this. And then the ones I like, I'll take those and I'll refine them a little bit more. So I'll actually come in and start putting the face or whatever in figure out where his hair is going to be, you know, how big and muscular he's going to be, whatever, start figuring out things like the costume or whatnot. So I'll, I'll kind of take each one to a certain level of finish um, as I go through. And then, so if I have, you know, like, uh, like I, I try, try to remember how many I did for Wolverine, but I think I did like 20. So I'll probably do like 30 or 40 sketches like this, where I just have several pages of them. And this is actually, we were talking about doing Deadpool at one point and we never did the Deadpool stuff. But I just did some quick thumbnail notes, so I had them. So this is actually uh, Deadpool kissing the front, the border of the sketch card, and over here he's kind of like stripping, like you know, using it, using like the the border of the sketch card, almost like a stripper pole kind of thing. So I was just trying to have fun, like what would you know, the character Deadpool would be very self conscious that he's on a sketch card. Yeah. So yeah. how would I how would I break the fourth wall on a sketch card? And so I was kind of playing around with ideas like that um, with those. Uh, and then, but yeah, I would just sit here and, and kind of thumbnail things out and I would have 
you know, 30, 40, whatever little squares like this. And I'm just cranking out a whole bunch of them. And then I'll pick the ones I like and kind of refine those. And so you'll have a bunch where this will be a finished piece of art and this one will be, you know, just a, a thumbnail or just, it'll be that much. And I just abandoned it and moved on to another one. And so I just keep doing that until I feel the ones that kind of, you know, uh, I kind of like. Uh, you guys actually have the best example of that, and that's that Wolverine one I had uh, that I gave to Trevor. So uh, I don't have that here to show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's going on, Don? Sorry about your tough day at work, man. See you tomorrow for sure. Uh, Kevin says, when I'm using my reference for my cards, I will actually take the reference image into Photoshop, crop it, scale it down to three and a half by two and a half baseball card size so that I can get the proportions correct uh, when drawing it. Um, yeah, that's actually I uh, with that trick I've done also. So this is fascinating to me. Yeah, that by the way, exactly what Kevin described is also another thing I do. Um, but, you know, with the advent of cell phones and really high resolution <laughs> cameras and stuff, um, a lot of times, I mean, I'll even do things like I'll take a photograph of my uh, of hot toys or something that I have in my possession or like I have action figures. So um, good example is when we do a Mandalorian set at some point, we're gonna do, I know we're gonna do more Mandalorian or Star Wars stuff. This is literally a little Ravel model I picked up for like 20 bucks or whatever. And then I put it together and it was that crappy fake silver kind of, you know, plastic. Yeah. Uh, so I actually chromed the entire thing and then I went through and weathered it and I added where the rust and where the burns would be, tried to replicate the, the jacked up paint job on one side and it's a little more refined on the other. So I went through and actually tried and following the, like watching the show and tried to match the damage and the paint patterns and stuff to the show as much as possible. So I have a fairly screen accurate, you know, little toy the size of my hand. Um, that I can come in, move my light around, get great reference of, take a picture of it with my cell phone, and now I've got instant reference. And so I, that's actually why I tend to use my cell phone a little more. Uh, then, of course, I have to go back and delete it because I have hundreds of gigabytes of photos. Now, now Lee, you actually just touched on, um, you are about to get about 20 or 30 people to say, hey, can you paint my miniatures for me? Now that you've <laughs> said that out loud and showed them what you did. Well, here's another one. This is a model. This is literally just a model of, uh, of you know, Din Djarin from, uh, it's another Ravel one. But uh, yeah, or B Bandai, I'm sorry. I think this one's Bandai. But, uh, but yeah, I needed some lighting reference. So again, I chromed his armor and then I assembled it. But you can see it's just, you know, the cheap, you know, little thing. But I was able to actually go in and chrome his armor and stuff and uh so i can actually get the type of lighting and effects that i need so this is great for lighting reference and whatnot and also it's like if i want to sketch out a pose or something so i can do something a lot of artists would just take a screen grab and the pro that's fine and i totally endorse that the only problem i have is uh, i hated periodically is i would do that and then everybody now has the exact same image so we're all drawing the same picture and the character always looks the same so i was trying to to change it up a bit very interesting now you <laughs> work with a lot of different licensed properties is there anything that you can talk about legally that you're excited to be working on right now um i'm currently working well i just did the hp lovecraft film festival poster which was awesome um i'm working on uh, a project for GI Joe, technically several. Um, and then I also have uh, uh, the one, the big project I'm currently working on that I'm super excited about is uh, I am a character designer for a video game designed by Richard Garfield who created Magic the Gathering. Kind so the big game. yeah, so working on that, like being actually the, the character design lead on that is awesome. Although I will admit they're, they, you know, uh, I can't really talk about the game or any of that, the aspects of it, but it was funny because a lot of the stuff I do, uh, my personal projects that I've worked on over the years tend to be like monsters or horror film or something like that. And we're doing something that's not, you know, horror film is nowhere near on the mood board. Yeah. And they had this character who was described as, as angry and violent and like, you know, the, the, the best fighter and all this stuff. 
And so I, I drew something that was absolutely savage. And they were like, oh, we love that, but that's nightmare fuel. Like, you need to pull that back a bit. <laughs> So, so you're not allowed to say you're working on a game that's based on Smurfs, is what you're telling me. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, I can definitely also say I'm not working on a game based on Smurfs. <laughs> that one I can legally say. I'm not working on a game based on Smurfs. All right. Okay. Because that would be a Smurfing good time. Oh, har har. <laughs> so when you're... um. We know that when you're doing a project, the first thing you're going to do is thumbnail. You're going to find source material. You're going to thumbnail. Uh, then you're going to do the sketch kind of like uh, Ben. Um, and from there, do you do the backgrounds first and then sketch over the top? Or do you kind of get the sketch and then figure out what you want to do with the background? Um, well, that's sort of the great thing about gouache is I can do whatever the hell I want. So... Uh, on this picture, I actually painted Yoda first, and or I did, I'm sorry, I did R2 and Yoda's ship back here, and it's mist. And then once I had the mist, then I did Yoda. Then I did the rest of the background. So, but it was more or less because I was trying to get the contrast level of R2 and the ship back here before I did Yoda. And then once I got Yoda, I knew how far I wanted to push the contrast on the rest of it. So it really does depend on the piece. Um, uh, on this one, I think I did the background first. Uh, I almost always tint the background in some way. So I have a bunch of, you know, so like this would be, uh, this is actually one, these are cards that I handmade. So I made my own really thick cards once uh, out of like Strathmore 500 series paper. You can actually still see the watermark on that one or the, the embossing. But these I would actually coat. So uh, I would coat these with just because I like working on a tinted surface, you know, I don't like working on white. So in that regards, I would do the background first. And then, you know, but as far as like the detail in the background, just depends on the card or the subject matter, what I'm painting, how it works best or whatnot. Uh, jumping into the, the chat, uh, Paul says Smurf Fortnite. Now that's a mental image. Oh, good God. Uh, Hellbolt says uh, Tula just got taken out on a stretcher. Uh, looks like a head injury. Well, I mean, he hit his head against the Bills and they covered it up. There's actually the NFL PA is investigating the handling of Tua's concussion last week against Buffalo uh, because they don't believe it's possible he should have came back for this, the second half. The fact that he hit his head again and is being taken on a stretcher probably tells you that the, uh, the story about him hurting his back and not his head was a cover up and a lie. So it will be very interesting to see what happens uh, handling Tua moving forward because anybody who saw the game saw Tua's knees buckle last week, and that's a, a certain indicator that you shouldn't be playing the game. So, uh, Yeah, that usually means that your brain shut off. E exactly. When, when, when your body dies from the waist down and it's non-spinal, it means your brain said, nope, no, sir. Tapping yeah. out. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Excellent. Now, if you said you, you'd love to do dragons and you got to do some absolutely stunning dragons uh, that we were able to acquire from you, mm -hmm. um, you and I are privy to the rest of the, the series uh, mm -hmm. in, in the artist's uh, discord that not everybody can get to. And again, peeling back that curtain. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 100, how excited are you for the the dragon box that's coming out? Uh, <laughs> on a scale of 1 to 100? Uh, probably about 120, 130. <laughs> I, so I like dragons, and I like that this is something that, like, uh, you know, I didn't have to draw an IP, so I could just make something up, which I really liked. Um, and that's something I, I love is periodically we'll have that flexibility uh, to, to do something that's kind of fantasy or just made up for the heck of it and, and see where it goes. So uh, that was a lot of fun. And I, uh, uh, you know, seeing what the other artists have contributed is really cool. So uh, there's, there's some amazing stuff in there. And we got, uh, are we allowed to talk about any of the artists? Actually, I'm going to lead into one because yes and no. Okay. Uh, so something pretty. 
Yeah, that's who I was going to mention. Kayla's stuff is awesome. So uh, we actually had a conversation with her via, you know, in in the the the, the private server. Um, mm. And as for for those who don't know, something pretty on Twitch, something pretty, just go. She's great. Today she was uh, she's a little under the weather. She was streaming uh, Fallout Four, <laughs> uh, just running around capping people with a revolver. It was actually fun to watch. Um, and she's usually doing larger scale pieces. Um, she tends to be larger format mm -hmm. and she had mentioned it, it was a bit of a challenge for her to do an art card sized piece. Um, and she says she feels like she did a really good job. I will tell you all the details she gets in the larger format pieces she did. She actually managed to scale down proportionately onto an art card and it makes them absolutely stunning mm -hmm. and eye-catching um did you get a chance to see her stuff um i don't think i've seen all of it but I, i've seen a couple pieces that she posted yeah it um, is it can, i saw the half finished kit yeah yes uh can, so for those who don't know our uh when you're on our discard discord you do have access to the artists we try to uh, find artists that are willing to, you know, hang out with everybody because, as you know, a lot of these artists are extremely busy. Um, and we try to get it so that, you know, you can interact and really pick the brain of the artist when, when they're available. In addition to that, uh, DCD Collects has our own private browser that's just us with the artists where we can kind of talk about projects, uh, things that we're looking for that they may have on hand that we can acquire from them, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, the most of the artists tend to hang out in there and kind of share each other's work. And, and I'll tell you, um, I'm not going to lie. It's absolutely working to our advantage because you guys are, and gals are seeing each other going, Oh, I got to step, I got to step it up. Oh, look, <laughs> at, look at this person. Oh man, wait, hold on. Uh, no, this isn't finished. I, I'm still working on this one. Cause, and, and it's, it's amazing to see the big reveals that are going on, uh, mm -hmm to everybody because you can see the the artist go oh mine's not done yet hold on i need another three days <laughs> and then three days <laughs> later a, a version will come out like oh wow that's really good and then somebody will be like well hold on let me show you my finished work uh so the, the it's it's been <laughs> i'm not arguing <laughs> i love it <laughs> and kevin's uh, like yeah we get inspired by each other we're fans too. oh yeah i i totally like i have a full airbrush so i was i was cracking up because we were talking earlier today uh paul had posted um his amazing artwork that he did for another project are we have we mentioned that one yet uh we have mentioned that paul is working on a project i don't believe we've officially told everybody what he's working on Okay, but uh, so yeah, Paul's working on a project and he posted some of the artwork from it and I was just blown away and uh, uh, it looks amazing. And it was really funny because I was looking at it going, you know, it's like I was, I was at first, I was astonished by the speed at which he was cranking them out. So I was just all like, this, this mofo has got nothing to do all day. Like He's just <laughs> boom, boom, masterpiece, masterpiece, masterpiece. And it's like, dude, how are you doing that so fast? And then I looked and I realized he was airbrushing. <laughs> and I'm like, I should do that. I should, I should whip out my airbrush. And I've, and I had mentioned that to him. It's like, I'm very tempted to pull out my airbrush and see if I can't, you know, uh, uh, up my speed, but also, you know, my game as well. And then he's all like, oh yeah, I've just got this $15 airbrush. And I'm looking over at my airbrush kit where I've got my compressor cost like, you know, $1,500. And I'm just all like, God damn it. <laughs> so it's, it's proof that you don't have to spend a lot of money. Keep in mind at the time I was, when I bought that air compressor and all the, I use my water, you know, I use a whole series of my water brushes and stuff and some, uh, uh, Grex brushes, but, um, you know, at the time a, I was sponsored by Grex. So I got some really cool stuff from them, but the Iwata stuff that I bought, you know, I was doing, you know, automotive car and like high end art for like, you know, uh, uh, galleries and stuff. So, uh, in that regards, they wanted to see you using expensive equipment, but when you see Paul's stuff and you realize he drew that with, you know, $20 in art supplies, including the airbrush, um, <laughs> Uh, it, it's, it's mind blowing. And you realize it doesn't cost a lot to be an artist. If, you know, if you want to crank out really good art, all it takes is just dedication. That's all it is. You just have to stay focused and dedicated to it. You don't need 
you know, the, the big expensive artwork and the expensive brushes don't mean crap if you are dedicated. And uh, uh, yeah, again, the stuff that Paul and Kevin and the rest of the, the gang are cranking out is just is gorgeous and it is inspiring to look at. Hello, Mel. Hello, Jimmy. Mel, Jimmy. What's up, Jedi Jimmy? Uh, Paul's like, well, the brush was 15 bucks, but the compressor was 60. <laughs> <laughs> And there you go. And, and you also, I mean, and that's true because you have, you see these artists uh, coming from third world countries who are literally, uh, you know, pulling hair out of a, a, a dead horse tail and clamping it to a, a stick and, and painting Mona Lisa ripoffs. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not necessarily, don't get me wrong, the equipment helps, uh, but talent's talent. Yeah. And, and I'll just flat out say this don't believe what you see on TikTok. No. <laughs> I, I see these videos constantly where I watch somebody start a drawing and then suddenly they cut to this beautiful finished drawing and it's this amazing masterpiece and stuff. And it's like that, that, that first two strokes that you drew that was in the film aren't even in that final piece. <laughs> so it's like, this is just editing, you know, it's, it's the magic of editing and things like that. And, you know, or the, the event was staged or something. So yeah, don't, don't, don't watch these people on TikTok or Instagram and, and think, oh, wow, that guy's, you know, super, their art's amazing. Don't get me wrong, but they did not draw it in the way that they're making it look like they drew it. You know, they did not do it bent over with a paintbrush up their butt while humming the national anthem. That is not how it's done. So you've uh, seen my videos. I have. Okay. And I just want to say, you know, fantastic art, but I know you painted that before you crammed the brush up your butt. That's, that's, true. <laughs> that's true. Actually, I didn't. Uh, they just shot me from the waist up. I didn't actually, there was no art underneath there. Yeah, there is, a, there's actually an artist named Stan Prokopenko. He uh, uh, has a school called proko.com, uh, an online art school, which is a really good art school, by the way, if you're interested. But uh, he actually did do a video on Instagram not long ago where he was making fun of that, where he was sitting down and he had, you know, he was painting, he had a paintbrush in his mouth, he had a paintbrush in each hand, he had a paintbrush, you know, in each foot, and he's sitting there cranking out like six drawings all simultaneously. And then when he stands up and cheers when he's done after the timer counts down, you see a picture actually fall out of his pants. So like another picture completed and he's all like, and that's how you do it on TikTok. But it was, it was just really funny. <laughs> Kevin's in my channel. He says, I wish I could draw as fast as TikTok. Yeah, it's just video editing. And I just, I, you know, and I'm not bashing the guys on TikTok or anything. I just, I hate that because it gives people unrealistic expectations. And then you have these people who want to be artists who go and they try to draw or paint like that. And they can't because, you know, it's staged. And, uh, and you know, there's, I'm not saying nobody can paint like that, but there's certainly very few people who can. And, uh and I'm especially noticing that, you know, 99% of the people I've seen on TikTok who are claiming the stuff that they did in this TikTok video was done in one session in 30 seconds. Uh, you know, no, no, you didn't. Because <laughs> again, that, that first stroke or that first circle you see for the portrait isn't even in the final portrait. So they did one picture, they projected the next, sketched it out, made it look impeccable. And then they made it off as if they, they sight lined it. And it's not like that drives me nuts because that gives, again, gives people unrealistic expectations and it hurts aspiring artists because it demoralizes them when they're like, Oh, I wish I could be that good. Now a, for somebody that wants to put these into perspective that maybe mm -hmm. doesn't watch your channel as often as, as I and the rest of the people in this chat do um, to put out a level of, of, gouache card like the ahsoka or the rex how long is that from beginning to end typically if you're um uninterrupted or if you're explaining as you go if i'm not streaming yes i can usually crank them out in uh you know uh, uninterrupted usually cranking them out you know uh 30 minutes to an hour and a half usually um for stuff like this uh, if I'm not streaming, if I am streaming, you're looking at like three or four hours because, <laughs> because like right now, yeah, you know, I'm leaning my head on my, on my drawing hand and I'm holding this pen, just do, 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 not painting during this time. So that's all lost time. Um, 
but it is sometimes hard to talk and, and get a, a, a good thought through while you're painting. So I'll tend to put my brush down when I'm, when I'm streaming. And even sometimes when I'm streaming, I'll tell people, hang on, I'm going to ignore chat for a few minutes and I need to focus. And because I know that there's an area that's going to be difficult and I might avoid it. And then when I go to hit that area, I'll tell everybody, you know, yeah, uh, focus time, not talking, give me a minute. And then once I'm done, then I get back caught up on chat or whatever. Now, knocking those out in 30 minutes, uh, specifically, which Swedish speed metal band are you listening to uh, while you are doing that? Um, well, uh, probably uh, Teresa's Tire, uh, Corporal Clowning, Ramstein. Ramstein's not Swedish, you know, but the other guys are like Nordic, so I guess that still counts. Um, Sabaton, definitely a Swedish metal band I listen to. <laughs> So where's where's in flames from? Uh, I don't know. I have to figure that out. I was a big in flames fan, not so much for the music, just for the stage presence and show. Yeah, see, that's another thing is I tend to uh, I'll listen to documentaries or news or something like that when I work um, where I work best is uh, music. I'll just open up Spotify and, you know, I have a subscription just so I don't have to deal with ads, you know, and just blast you know music and the more aggressive the better usually hellbolt said it is sweden for in flames oh cool oh well, there you go uh for those who don't know in flames in flames um literally take their name uh to heart they have they spend like 150 percent of their budget just on pyro uh, and the rest of it's just them sitting on stage because they can't afford anything else other than the massive amount of flames, sparks, and fireballs uh, that are constantly erupting around them. Um, <laughs> so fantastic visually. Um, I have no idea what they're singing about because I'm too busy going, ooh, fire. Hey, they watched Ramstein's Fire Fry video and went, ooh, like that. <laughs> I, I can tell you I have had the pleasure of seeing uh, Ramstein live. Um, bef the before they got banned the first time, <laughs> um, I got. That's just because people don't like Bailey's and cream. <laughs> yeah, they don't like uh, hoses. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah, they don't like hoses. Um, but that was that was a a show that changed everything for me. Mm -hmm. Um. It was like, wow, now I know why people listen to Kiss, even though Kiss is trash. It's the stage show that is oh, amazing. Kiss's stage show is amazing. I don't own a single one of their albums. I no. don't listen to them on Spotify. They're not my playlist. Yeah, and it, like, I'll, I'll mute, but I'll watch the fireballs in the blood. It's like, what was that? The song is like, I was made for loving you. When that comes on, I just groan because that's not a rock song. It's a disco song. Paul Stanley even admitted it. It was basically a bet from a producer who bet him. You know, or he basically he he bet the producer it was easier to make a disco hit than it was a rock hit, and the producer I guess basically said prove it, and then they their biggest hit was a disco song. <laughs> Kevin I, says I saw them live once, and I thought my face was gonna melt off like the scene from Raiders in the Lost Ark. Yeah, Ramstein or Kiss? <laughs> uh, great question, Kevin. Balls in your court. I, I almost interviewed Ramstein once. That was pretty cool. I can't imagine having to deal with, with Tig in an interview because if he's anything <laughs> like a stage persona, it's wow. Uh, he said well, he's, uh, his family, he's, uh, his family is all, are all poets. Hmm. So he's actually, he grew up in a family of, of notable poet writers. And, of and he writer, was an Olympic-level swimmer Yeah, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, which explains his body uh, when you see him in the early Rammstein videos and the abuse that he gives himself is because the, the guy was like 4% body fat, but yeah. built like a, uh, a brick uh, turd palace. Yep. And I'll, I'll tell you the Rammstein story off stream because it's not appropriate for the DCD <laughs> audience. Just, just said, I saw Kiss at Tiger Stadium with their first concert of putting their makeup back on. And a uh, a band called Alice in Chains opened for them. I wonder if those guys went on to do anything. 
Oh, man, you can go all the way around the circle on that one, can't you? Yeah. Actually, we were also talking about, like, experimenting and stuff with cards. Did you want to talk about that at all? Or um, Yeah. Actually, I was going to hopefully lead into uh, something along those lines. So thank you for doing a rough segue. I enjoy it. Um, <laughs> now, well, it's, it's, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm messing right. with you, Lee. I'm messing with you. So for those who don't know, Lee and I are brethren. We're close friends, so we, we, we dig on each other a lot. Um, so art card, we have, uh, a, a master art cardist in our midst with Ice Wolf, uh, somebody that mixes multiple mediums, uh, including geology, uh, into, into that. Um, <laughs> is there anything that you're experimenting dude, with? No, sorry. Ice Wolf. This is the part that trust me about Ice Wolf. The dude literally saws pieces of rock thin enough to incorporate them into sports cards and it is trippy as hell they look amazing and they look, and I, thing. They look great i i want him to figure out a way to make a electric induction powered light a, a, an induction powered light led panel for the display case so that he can just set it down and it's just backlit and glowing and looks awesome and every time you want to charge it you just sit on your phone charging so I, mean, I, I know that technology exists, idea. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I, I, I've been kind of, I dabbled with the idea of doing custom cards like that, but then it's like, nah, I, you know, but I'm an artist. I got to draw and I got to paint and do stuff. So I actually have been dabbling with this idea. Hmm. This is a sketch card. This is one of my sketch cards. And I started incorporating some of the same stuff that the custom sketch cutters uh, sketch card, you know, the, the, sorry, the, the card, uh, guys like card killer and stuff who do those amazing custom cards. I started incorporating some of their stuff. So it is literally a, a painting, a gouache painting, um, with a hologram. Uh, and then I have to, uh, uh, treat the surface and be able to paint on the hologram as well. So I'm trying to trying to create varying levels of effect and I may go into like some 3D stuff, but this is literally just me screwing around by the way. So I do this regularly. I just suddenly decide, well, that looks bad. I wonder what that looks like. Let me put these away. These are my bl blanks and various other sketch cards laying here by the way. Um, but yeah, so this is what the sketch card looked like originally. And for guys like, uh, you know, Kevin and Paul and whatnot, when I go to shows and I'm doing sketch cards, You'll notice very faintly, I have the start starting of a drawing there of Obi Wan. Um, I usually get these made by the hundreds, and I'll take you know fifty to hundred of them, and I will pre-draw a bunch of characters that I I get asked to draw a lot. And so when I go to the convention, if somebody comes up and says, "Ooh, I want an Ahsoka," flip through my pre-drawn sketch cards, it's like ah, I have an Ahsoka, so I have one that I can actually hand them, you know, so I can or I can finish it. And so this speeds me up immensely at a show so I can just crank stuff out quickly. And uh, it only, like, I'll just dedicate one day to just sitting there and pre-sketching out a whole bunch of cards to have them ready for the show. Uh, and, and that pays off, you know, immensely when you're sitting there trying to crank these out for, you know, 20, 30 bucks each at the shows uh, for just the quick pen and ink stuff. Um, the painted stuff I usually sell in the hundreds. Uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, so to crank out the really quick ones, uh, I like having them pre-drawn so I can just get them done fast. Uh, but yeah, it's literally the same thing. And then just treated it with that holographic foil to try and create a original art card all the way. Uh, it's been basically half painted, half special effects, I guess. <laughs> and by the way, this kind of comes from that idea. Like one thing I, I that bugs me about the the sketch cards and the art cards and stuff is I watch some of those breaks where guys are flipping through them. And, you know, they go, you know, card, 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 you know, you know, they just like shooting through the cards really fast. And they'll get to an art card and go, huh, huh, art card, you know, and or, you know, or sketch card, and they'll throw it to the side. And, you know, sometimes you'll be lucky if they put it in a top loader. Most of the time it just goes in a penny sleeve. Um, but it's really sad because they don't realize that's a one of one, you know, that's, that's original art that they're holding. Um, but just they they hold such little value. So that's why I love the, uh, I think it was the Topps uh, Museum uh, collection. Uh, they actually 
you know, uh, they do the reprints of this. I got my reprint of that one too. So I did the, I worked on the Topps Museum collection. And so you have the cards. So here's one I did for uh, Salvador Perez, Kansas City Royals. But yeah, so I did a painting of him and they cropped it off the, the card I painted it on and then printed it on another card, which is kind of cool. And, uh, but yeah, so these are, you know, I don't want to say common, but I guess these are, these are uncommon. And then the APs of these are rare, but they have, um, uh, but now they've, they've made it. So when people realize they have the one of one, it actually says one of one on the card now. And so suddenly it has a lot more gravitas when the card guys are going through it because they don't care that it's art. They care that it says one of one on it, which is pretty pathetic. Uh, yeah. But you know, from the standpoint of an artist going, dude, they're all one of ones. You know, If it's original art, it's a one of one. But if it's not shiny and doesn't sparkle, it doesn't catch their attention. So yeah, so that was kind of why I was playing around with this. So in essence, that card is basically three levels. You have your background uh, gouache, you have the foil level, and mm-hmm. then the, the, the paint over the top. Yep. So yeah, there's, there's, uh, yeah. So I have the the painting, a foil, and then another painting on top of the foil. And then I'm also like, you know, experiment. This is the first one I've done. So experimenting with this one, I'll still kind of dabble on it a little bit here in a bit. But, uh, you know, after I do this one, I'll probably try to find other ways to push the medium as well. So I, I like the idea that if I can do something that is, uh, you know, super cool and, and you know, uh, and it's collectible and whatnot. So I've got I've got some other ideas for things I can do uh, that I want to try out as well. But uh, but yeah, there's you know currently three levels on this one. Some of the other stuff I'm working on, you're looking at like anywhere between five and ten levels oh, wow. um, of of what I'm trying to see if I can do. But if it doesn't if it doesn't help the art, it's pointless to do. Just doing it for the sake of doing it is stupid. It's just a waste of time. Um, I think this works really well. It's very simplistic. You know. The, the background's hollow foil, the main character is matte. And so you can kind of see the glossy shift between the two mediums on it. And I think it looks really cool. It's hard to see, um, you know, I'm not sure how easy it is to see on camera, but uh, uh, the, there you go. You can see the background painting there a little bit better. So he's on Jakku. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I just, I'm always trying to figure out some way to, to push a medium more if I can. So, although I will admit with this card set, I did my stuff. I'd never done the card set before. I researched some of the cards from the year before and I was really proud of the cards I did. And then I've seen the cards of some of the guys this year did. And I'm like, wow, I feel like I phoned it in. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I could have taken another month on those cards, man. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but overall, I mean, they still, I was still very proud of them, but yeah, I, I, when I saw what everybody else was doing, I was kind of like, maybe I, I should have pushed myself harder. <laughs> now, the, the K2SO, is that the first time you've ever done that on a card? Uh, the hollow foil stuff? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. This, so this is literally can... the number one. This is the very first time. We can establish that as your premium. That is, if somebody was trying to get that off of you, that is going <laughs> to be a mean mamma jamma to get off of you. Because that is the, the Genesis card. I wouldn't have thought of it that way, but yeah, technically. Hmm. Interesting. I, I, pr- I probably would just price it like I do my other stuff. So this one, when I'm finished with it, the really high end, you know, pieces like this that I do that are painted on this type of cardstock, I would normally do for, you know, the really high end ones would go for about 200. Uh, nice painted ones would usually go for about 100. And then if it's just, uh, you know, pen and ink with some color and stuff on it, it'll go anywhere between 30 and 50. And this one's going to have a phenomenal story behind it. Yeah. So this is me trying really hard to see how far I can push the card before I wreck it. There you go. <laughs> and then also, by the way, uh, tools. Uh, we were talking about gouache earlier. Yes. Because I realized I did not put the glow on her, uh, her, her uh, lightsaber. But there's something I wanted to show. Uh, I probably should join on my stream, too. But um, a lot of times people ask me what kind of color pencils I use. And, uh, you know, invariably, I almost always say I use uh, Holbein uh, because I just I've recently discovered Holbein. I still have some Prismacolors I'm working my way through. But I still use uh, Prismacolor um, for white and black in particular. And so the reason being is uh, each of the, the different brands 
of, uh, of color pencils, they all have a different kind of shade uh, to the color. So that was nine to sharpen. So let me put these away. Uh, one's black, one's not sharpened. So neither of which are <laughs> usable in this. But um, so, you know, this is actually a full graph, you know, a full white kind of color pencil, uh, Create a color. I think, I'm trying to remember if this one's water soluble or not. Some of them are water soluble, some of them aren't. Um, I'm trying to remember if this one is. This is actually a holder so I can make it a little bit longer and easier to hold. And by the way, these things are a godsend because here's my black pencil. Try holding that in your damn hand. <laughs> Drawing with it. <laughs> so I, I get the most out of my color pencils, damn it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so with the white ones, I will use uh, uh, a mix because uh, this one gives me a really good white because it's solid. I can actually press really hard. You'll also notice that the tips are a little different on some of my pens. Let me see if I have a different example. Here you go. Yeah, that one. So you'll notice like the, my pencils, I have these really long, so I have a special sharpener that gives me these ridiculously long slim tips, which are great for doing tiny details and stuff. Um, and that's actually, do I have that handy? <laughs> I was using it earlier and then I set it aside because I sharpened like 40 pencils with it and uh, it got hot here. <laughs> so. But yeah, so this is the AFMAT sharpener. Uh, so I use, uh, so it actually has settings on the back for what type of tip do you want? Do you want a short tip or do you want a long tip? And I love this because it'll actually stop sharpening once it's sharp. It, it will literally not grind your pencils down, which is awesome. Uh, unless the tip is breaking. But then the whole line stuff, let me grab my whole line here. Uh, the whole line pencils. Um, so the ones I just showed you, of course, are the, the Creative Color and uh, Prismacolor. And Prismacolor has two brands, by the way. So they have the Prismacolor everybody's used to, and then they have what's called Verithin, which the Verithin are very hard. Uh, the Prismacolor is their soft brand. And then uh, Holbein also has a white, uh, which is fairly soft. But then they also have what's called a soft white. And it literally says, I'm not sure if it's showing up there, but it literally says right here, use knife to sharpen. So you'll notice that one's hand sharpened yeah. uh, because the a, it is so soft, a pencil sharpener will just rip it off. Um, th uh, these things are awesome. So what's great about these is you can use these all together. So if I want to make a soft glow, I can use the, the Verithin. And that would be for like the outer areas when I'm fading into darkness or something. And then grab the Prismacolor. And now I get in a little bit closer. And you get just a little bit more glow out of that. And then grab the whole line, which is wider, even wider than the, the Prismacolor. But I can do that. And so I get a really nice glow in there. And then if I really wanted to go crazy, I would pull out either the Trita Color uh, or the whole line Soft White um, to really make this center part pop here. But I don't have to because I used white paint on it. So, <laughs> uh, and then also there's another trick, which is uh, Holbein actually sent me one of these, and I love it. But it's called a melt stick, and I can literally come in here and now blend out my lightsaber glow so that it looks. It's a pen, but it's a pencil blender, and it makes that lightsaber look like it's glowing now. Yeah. So. But, uh, but yeah, so neat, you know, just combining various uh, brands and various materials because they all have different effects. So the, the Prismacolors don't release as much color, so they're not as dense as the Holbein stuff is, but they're great for doing like light shading and glows. But I prefer the, the Holbein in general. Now that Ahsoka is gorgeous. Where did you say that was going again? That's going in the Star Wars animated set that oh, we're doing for DCD Christ. Collects. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> There's the... Man, that's so really the, nice the wacky way my pencils are sharpened versus normal. So there's no, your normal sharpen, and that's what I use. <laughs> so if you ever want to stab somebody. That's that that's what you want to use. Although it's soft, I, I'm not sure how far you'll get in. Don't use the soft white, yeah. But yeah, I can actually show you. So here's the little piece of it broke off there. But so there's the soft white Holbein. And then 
if I grab the varathin and I'll press pretty hard on that too, but you'll notice even if I press at its hardest, I'm not sure how well it shows up on camera, but the, the Holbein is much more bright and dense yeah. than the varathin. So it's, it's a cool thing. You can actually transition. This is the worst. That's the best. And then the, uh, uh, the Prisma color one is kind of the, the, the Prisma standard white is kind of like in between the two. And it makes a good transition. Actually, you'll notice, I'm not sure if you can see it there, but the whole, the Prisma color actually looks almost grayish compared to that white. I'm not sure how well it's coming across, but, uh, but yeah. So dirty secrets, use good art supplies. <laughs> Um, if you're doing stuff professionally, again, you don't have to use expensive art supplies to be an artist. Uh, I started out drawing on copy papers with number two pencils. <laughs> hey, Ruru2, welcome to the stream. I'm actually streaming on DCD Collects right now. Sorry, we got guys in my chat. Yeah. Uh, so check them out. You'll get a much clearer picture than this blurry crap I'm streaming. I'm, I'm simulcasting. <laughs> No. But there we, uh, there we go. Quick art class. Sorry. I just, when we talk about art, I'm just like, Ooh, let's do this. I want to show this. I want to do this. I, by the way, that's my stream is I constantly go ADD. We talk about art. We talk about art process, art business, you know. All right. <laughs> uh, take care, chef. Good to see you, man. Take care, chef. Thanks for hanging out. So without giving up spoilers, what do you think of Andor? What I think Andor, Andor is amazing. I love it. Yeah, uh, I, I I'm an saw, episode behind right now. So, but I, I saw a uh, a drawn comic where somebody was holding up an empty box and it said, "This is where we keep all the bad episodes of Andor." <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, Andor. I love Andor because it does what I think you should do with Star Wars, which is uh, Rogue One took a, you know, kind of, you know, uh, I don't want to say throwaway line, but um, they, they, they basically took the concept of where did the droid get those plants and made an entire movie out of it, showed an adventure. It was literally a throwaway line. Plans were beamed to this ship, you know, <laughs> where are they? So, and... And so this whole, it, it starts this whole adventure. That's a cool story to tell. Um, more so, and that's also, I, I liked Solo as well. Um, it had its flaws, obviously, because of the production issues and whatnot. And then, of course, budget constraints because of said production issues. So they can only do so much to fix it. But, um, uh, but I do think that uh, Andor is the way you really need to do Star Wars. Is It is, you take a concept that's already been established uh, in the Star Wars universe, which in this case with Andor is, you know, you wouldn't believe the things I've had to do uh, for the rebellion, for the resistance um, that he's, he said something of those lines in Rogue One. Yeah. And then you can make an entire, an entire series out of it. It's all like K2SO. This is K2SO. You know, rep uh, I reprogrammed him. He's, you know, Imperial dro droid that I reprogrammed. Cool. We're going to get that story at some point. Um, so, you know, I, I, I want that, you know, I, I want that backfill of story, which is why I like it a lot better than the, the sequel trilogies, because the sequel trilogies don't really backfill any story for me, mm -hmm. you know. And as much as I think this, the prequel trilogy does the same thing where it backfills a story, um, again, it has its faults but it's mostly because I think that they were so engaged in the technology side of filmmaking that they forgot about the art of filmmaking. Um, and, and so I think that you know, the story kind of suffered uh, at the expense of perfecting the visual effects needed to tell that story. Uh, but I still think it's better than the sequel trilogy. <laughs> uh, Brent says, hey Lee, can you make a DC one of one card for a chase card? an art one featuring dc featuring uh, dc yeah listen nobody wants my face on a card i get professional pictures done for my family every year send them to my mother and she doesn't even hang them on the wall 
I don't know why. I see out of them. <laughs> I, yeah, that's right. I don't even know why anybody would want that. That's that's uh, that's that's pretty rough. If I can't even get my mom to hang a picture of me. We'll just do. We'll do one. We'll get all the artists to draw the other artists. <laughs> there you go. So like Kevin has to draw Paul. Paul has to draw me. I have to draw Kayla. Kayla has to draw Bing. Bing has to draw me. So just have everybody draw somebody who uh, does something for uh, uh, DCD collects. And then the base cards are each of the artists. So we do five. We do so each. We each of the artists would do a self portrait, a card of one of the other artists, and one and either you, uh, Doug, or Trevor. Or actually, you, Doug, and Trevor, and and that so you, Doug, and Trevor are kind of the base set. <laughs> yeah, I'm about as basic as it gets. So that's that's. that's and then people can sit there and, and fight over who gets the uh, like who's going to get the full Bing set of uh, DCD collects. <laughs> it's the uh, Project 2020, but with uh, with nerds. There you go. <laughs> Instead of baseball players. <laughs> That would be cool. Paul's like, oh, dear God, a card of me would drive people mad. <laughs> yeah, we're friends on Facebook, so I've seen you. And it would just be very pale. Because <laughs> in, in my defense, so would mine. Mine would be very pale. The art version of In the Mouth of Madness. Yeah, there you go. There's, in fact... <laughs> There's my card and Paul's card would look like that. <laughs> Yours would have a little bit more hair. My, mine would have that, that dirty blonde, yeah. Um, Brent's like, yeah, I'm a nerd for life. Uh, Hellbolt's like, well, what about the mods? <laughs> uh, mind you, Hellbolt is a mod. I think Hellbolt wants you to paint him. Paint him like one of your uh, Tatooine girls. Yeah, don't, 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 don't tempt me. I, I did that once. I had a guy actually come into my stream and say, paint me like one of your French girls. And he sent me a, or he, I, I, I went to his Facebook page and I drew his portrait and he was a, a large gentleman. <laughs> Let's just say he had an excessive BMI. And um, uh, I, but I drew a picture of him like in a classic kind of like uh, uh, playboy kind of like, you know, uh, discretionary pose where, you know, the important bits are kind of hidden, mm -hmm. so to speak, but they're naked, you know, in a reclining pose. Yeah. And so I yeah. did that. Uh, uh, but I, I painted him in his full BMI glory <laughs> um, in that pose and stuff. And like, you know, <laughs> <it's our fact. laughs> like here, I drew you like one of my French girls. Because I have a weird sense of humor and I, I have no shame, so I will do it. <laughs> yeah, little do you know, all of his French girls do the can-can and dress appropriately for the can-can. Nice. So, uh, that is, is Darth Maul. Yeah. And red background, red face, red lightsaber. Oh, yeah. How are you going to make that contrast? Oh, easy. Well, the the shift in value is going to come in. Like, I'll put, uh, I'll actually be working out here in a few minutes, probably. But so I will end up doing blah, 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 blah. Grab a little red. And believe it or not, a little purple. Um, so I try not to use black if I can avoid it uh, to darken a color because uh, it will make the color look kind of boring but I can throw a little purple in there. And now I can actually get that same contrast and still make it pop a bit. So I will admit one drawback to uh, doing this stuff for stream is I have a light right above me that always, this light here, I want to turn off. Oh, I'm using the wrong one. <laughs> um, but that light right there always causes me so much glare. So I usually leave it on for stream because it's great for everybody watching the stream, but it's horrible for me. <laughs> so sometimes I'll have to turn it off like that. But yeah, I can come in here now. And so this is really just the exact same color I used for his skin, plus a little splash of purple. I can use it to get this light coming off there. 
and kind of just blend it in and get all the, the shapes and forms of his head just using a little splash of purple. But I do, uh, I do highly recommend artists try to avoid using uh, black to darken your colors. You can use, you know, blues and browns, and uh, uh, in particular, blues and purples are great ones to use. Greens, depending on what your, uh, uh, if you're doing a warm or a cool color. Uh, and then I'll also use blues back here for kind of like the environmental lighting. So right now, everything around him is red. In fact. We're gonna have a little bit of a red glare glow back here. And I'll actually lighten that with a little bit of yellow too first. I'll probably mix in a little white at some point, but uh, I'll actually throw in a little bit of yellow to kind of lighten him. So same reason for not using black, although white's a little more forgiving. If you use too much white or black, you, you know, white and black make gray, so you end up graying out your colors and the picture kind of becomes a little boring. And it starts to look flat. Did you hear that, James? <laughs> Don't always reach for the black crayon. Uh, Hellbolt says there's there's nothing wrong with being a large BMI person. I'm a, a proud big man, and that's what gets me into the movies. That That's actually true. Hellbolt has been in uh, some Netflix shows as well as major motion pictures. Nice. Uh, no, there's nothing wrong with it. It was just, it was, it was the, it's, it's, uh, for me, it's not the size, it's the juxtaposition. There you go. It's, it's taking somebody who is of a large BMI and putting him in, in a pose that is generally reserved for the petite. And uh, so it's kind of like, actually, I drew a picture of, uh, uh, there's a character named Mr. F, Mr. Fredrickson in Kindergarten, and we will frequently draw pictures of him like dressed as a cheerleader staring at the pom pom going, how much did I have to drink last night? You know, but he's, you know, but again, it's always the juxtaposition that tells the story. Uh, so it's not definitely no negativity ever. <laughs> and Paul said, someone suggested I do a parody version of the Burt Reynolds Playboy spread, except for it would be Joe Exotic on a tiger skin rug. Oh, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. I will admit I've never seen Tiger King, and I hope I never do. Uh, I, admittedly, I got sucked into it. Um, I I don't mind casually uh, admiring a train wreck uh, or a absolute school bus fire um, <laughs> because it puts my life into perspective. It, it saves me a therapy session uh, for for that week. Um, because I can look at that and go, man, things are at tough. At least it wasn't me. <laughs> but I'm not that guy. Yeah. I'm not yeah, that for, person. For me, it usually comes down to, uh, uh, I was in the Marine Corps. I, I have seen some of the worst that humanity has to offer um, uh, in my travels around the world. Uh, my government-funded world tour. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's, uh, definitely not, <laughs> I, I don't need to put myself in a situation of watching the worst of humanity because I've seen it already. And, uh, and I would just rather maintain a nice positive, you know, uh, and I, 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 I like keeping a nice positive vibe. Happy little trees. I, I, oh, uh, well for me, happy, sarcastic little trees, sarcastic little trees is more what I am, but yeah. I mean, I, you've met my wife. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have. <laughs> so, yeah. and, uh, the, I, the sarcasm I was, must flow. Yeah, yes. I was instantly relieved to know that I could speak freely because she was going to give it twice as hard as she got it. Oh, God, yeah. She, she was actually, uh, when I first started out streaming, it was so awesome because she used to hang out on my stream. Now she's so busy working, she doesn't have time it very often. But um, it was funny because she would hang out on my stream and when we would get trolls, she would troll them back. And so we, we had, you know, our mods had instructions. It's like ban bots, but if somebody's legitimately trying to troll us, Maria's going to play with them first. And... Uh, <laughs> 
and, and it was really funny because we had one person come in and it's kind of our, 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 you know, our, our miracle success story for the stream is we actually had somebody come into the stream once and, you know, say, you know what, I came in here thinking I was going to cause trouble and, and start some stuff, but this is pretty damn cool. And that person is now one of my, my moderators and has been one of my, my <laughs> oldest subscribers. <laughs> But yeah, he, he admits, he freely admits he came in to troll our channel, but Maria was just so vicious and, uh, and would, it would return the, you know, she would basically rip into people so hard and we would just all sit back and laugh and she would critique their trolling abilities. <laughs> now, it, admittedly, in addition to being one of Lee's friends, I also helped procure a ghost pepper cider. Uh, that is <laughs> extremely rare. So I, I have brownie points there uh, that I plan on, if I ever get on her bad side, that'll be my one and only card for a free pass on the first one. Yep. <laughs> Just a reminder, it's like, I got you ghost pepper cider. Which, by the way, I even tried. That was good. It, it was. So um, I was trepidatious. I mean, I, I love hot stuff. I'm from Buffalo. But, you know, I don't want to drink hot stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I was trepidatious, but yeah, man, the, the, the master brewer, the, uh, the, the cider master, uh, un unbelievable. And, and all of that stuff is hand done. I can tell you the batch that she drank, um, I personally peeled 50% of the ginger that was in that. <laughs> um, my, my fingers burned because i don't know if you ginger is a caustic little root mm -hmm. um and oh, that's what i call my kid <laughs> and uh the the peppers uh we they kind of steep the peppers almost like a tea to make mm -hmm. to, to, to make that cider um but they're doing it in boiling cider because you have to um pasteurize the, the ciders it's 180 degrees um so basically the the warehouse uh we were brewing tear gas uh, <laughs> for, for one day where we basically told people don't come in to buy anything you know we left the door open like i will come to the door and help you you're not going to be able to walk three steps into this what this barn and people were like oh it's fine i just need to pick this up i'm like all right and they would like get four steps and like look at me like ah oh, this is no big deal and then they'd get that one full breath after holding their breath and you could just see their eyes turn beet red and they're like i just need a case of this ring me up <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i know yeah it was it was brutal uncle but, uncle yeah the final product was i mean there was nothing like it on the planet uh when we did that one time here is uh uh, we had a, a, a function with some of my friends from a, a company I helped found called XY, uh, XY Labs. And it was funny because the, the CEO of that company is from South Africa. And so they're, they're used to very, very spicy food. And we would bring him spicy stuff all the time. And he would just eat it like there was no, no problem. It was like, oh, yeah, no, this is good. I like it, you know. But, you know, not spicy enough. And then one day Maria's like, you know what, screw this. I'm going to make, you know him a special salsa so what she did was she made her regular salsa but then she made a supplemental additive so she brought in another uh salsa that basically was just roasted habaneros and just pure habanero just roasted mm -hmm. and then blended and she was trying to explain to people it's like a lab experiment depend you know here's your base salsa and then however much more kick you want add the habanero and and that stuff was just like uh, it was uh, fire. <laughs> it was it was fire in salsa form, and um, it was funny because Ari comes in, and she, he doesn't catch the whole description of this, and uh, she's like, "Oh yeah," and we have this habanero stuff over here, which you just mix in with that. And before he got to finish it, he just grabs a, ch a chip, grabs a huge shovel thing, crams it in his mouth, sits there chewing it, and then a minute later goes. <laughs> <laughs> he's like that hit the spot <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but when she was cooking that everybody had to leave the house yeah 
it got so bad with the when she, the the few like she was not bothered at all. It didn't phase her one iota. But everybody else was all like, you know, like the entire apartment because we live in an apartment complex at that time. Everybody in the apartment complex is like packing up and moving out. It's like that scene from Independence Day when the aliens come. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Neighbors leaving. Yeah, everybody was running from the building. It was pretty funny. So speaking of hot, um, as most of you know, I'm, I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, uh, you know, the place that invented the wing. And the original Buffalo wing, Buffalo sauce, the original one, only has two ingredients, liquid butter and Frank's red hot sauce. That's it. However hot you want it is how you mix the butter and the hot sauce. Um, so growing up in Buffalo, your default wings and <laughs> sandwiches and fingers are hot. That's it. That's the way it is. I'm, I'm laughing because Frank's Red Hot Hot Sauce, we have a giant bottle of it. Yeah. Nobody ever uses it. It's not hot enough. No, no, no. It's so, And that's <laughs> kind of where I was going is, to me, Frank's is ketchup. Yeah, that's what I put on my fries, on my you know mashed potatoes. Just no butter, just straight Frank's. That's what I. That's ketchup to me. There's no heat in that at all. It's just flavor. Um, and because growing up in Buffalo, everything has is is hot. The hot wings, everything's the Italian sausage is default spicy. Yeah, um, you kind of are desensitized to it. I have to go to Habanero to feel heat. Because anything below that 800 Scoville is 800,000 Scoville is just like, oh, it tastes good. Like jalapeno is nothing. Chili pepper is nothing. It's like I have to go habanero to feel heat. And when I want to feel heat, I'll go like mango habanero. Like that's where I go if I want a flavorful, full hot. So when people are like, oh, this is Tabasco, that's like, you know, vinegar and fire. It's like, uh, I. I put that on my breakfast. <laughs> yeah, I, when I was a, when I was a little kid, that was that's actually what I put on my eggs. Tabasco sauce. <laughs> Paul's like, um, note to self: This pasty Brit won't be eating eating dinner with y'all. So uh, one thing I do like uh, uh, my suggestion. I'm sure you know about this, but my suggestion, you know, now that you're in California, there it's everywhere. Cholula. Yes, we have it at home. Uh, Cholula is is heaven. Uh, it is. It's got a fantastic roasted flavor. It's not so spicy that it overpowers everything. Um, in fact, it's hardly spicy at all. I, I would put it at, I, mean, I can't say at, I, I would put it yeah, maybe around Tabasco. So, um, but uh, uh, definitely uh, to me tastes better than Frank's. Um, and I, I will admit I embarrassed my mother-in-law uh, for those who don't know, my wife is Mexican, uh, and uh, her mother-in-law one time offered to buy us anything we wanted from Costco, which is always a dangerous proposition because she doesn't have a Costco card. She wanted to buy a bunch of stuff at Costco, and then she's like, hey, I'm here. You know, mom's offered to buy us some stuff. Do you want anything from Costco? And I, and she's like, hey, Cholula's on sale. And I'm like, what's the limit? She's like, 10 bottles. And I'm like, I'll take 10 bottles of Cholula, <laughs> Yeah. And so there's now these two little Mexican women walking around Costco with a case because there's 10 bottles per kit. It's technically it's 10, it's 10 units, which yeah. is actually two bottles. So it's technically 20 bottles per case of Cholula. So the most stereotypical Mexican thing you can imagine, these two little Mexican ladies pushing a cart. It's like, just give them a couple of retread tires, you know, to go with that. And it would have been awesome. Um, but yeah, my, my wife gives me crap for that all the time. She's like, my, my mom's like, you embarrassed the shit out of me. Like, she offered to buy me anything I wanted. Just tell him it's for the white guy at home. He loves Cholula. There you go. <laughs> um, so Kevin's telling Paul, he said, just make sure you wear gloves and don't touch your eyes or face around them after touching anything. And Paul's like, yeah, duly noted. Oh, by the way. We didn't really cover this. So these are various types of blanks, by the way. So um, obviously this isn't a blank. This is actually that printed card we mentioned before, um, which is kind of cool. So I've actually been debating what to do with these. Um, I'm personally 
I think I'm actually going to try and paint over one. Like I want to do more of a painting on this. Uh, it's got a textured surface. I don't know if I can do the hologram thing on it, but you know, so I think I'm going to take one of these and experiment and see how it comes out. Just playing around. I hope somebody likes Salvador Perez. <laughs> um, and then like, these are my charity sketch cards. Uh, so in a lot of times it's, you know, what is, what makes a card valuable isn't just the art, it's also the card it's on. So these were actually a Force Awakens charity event where we did a bunch of cards and uh, uh, all the profits went to uh, uh, went to charity. So this all went to Make-A-Wish Foundation or the Starlight Foundation, I can't remember which one. Um, and then this was one, uh, this is actually a blank sketch card, but again, it was Celebration 6, 2012. Um, so same place I got those other ones, uh, but, uh, this was actually done by the 501st Legion. So the official Star Wars, uh, costuming fan club, uh, they are, uh, legendary. Uh, so every time you see stormtroopers at Comic-Con and they are amazing and screen accurate, it's these guys, uh, over 20,000 members worldwide. And, uh, when, uh, George Lucas was, uh, grand marshal of the, uh, 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 Tournament of Roses parade, uh, Pasadena for New Year's. Uh, all those stormtroopers you saw marching with them, every one of them was a member of the 501st Legion. <clears throat> so hundreds of them in that parade. And then again, so this is, you know, kind of, so this one would probably be like a $50 car normally. Um, so, uh, and then this was the, uh, yay, gravity. Um, and then these are, like I said, these are ones that I made up. So when DCD first started uh, doing stuff, um, I wasn't doing sketch cards anymore. I'd stopped uh, because, you know, it's like I, the amount of time and effort I put into my cards is not worth what I was getting paid by most of the companies. Um, so I kind of resigned from doing sketch cards. And then I was talking to Doug about it. And he's like, well, would you, would you do a few for, for us? And so I made my own sketch card backs and I printed these out on my printer and they were just ridiculously thick card stock. Um, I think this is the equivalent of 120 point or 180 point or something like that. It's, it's really thick. Um, but, uh, uh, but anyway, so I, I made these on my computer and then uh, printed them out on my printer on Strathmore 500 series illustration board. It's a really good illustration board. And then I made the textured surface on them to which I could draw and paint. And so we did these, uh, these are the leftovers from that. So the very first DCD project I did were actually on these cards that I handmade. Um, and so you can see they're shiny. So I went and I got my own UV coating on them. <laughs> it's all brushed on. So you can see the brush strokes and stuff. It's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, that was labor intensive as hell. And, and that was the Wolverine one. If um, I'm not mistaken, right? Was it? I uh, I think I I used I only only used it for two sets. So yeah, it would have been the very first one and Wolverine. Um, and then uh, then I uh, since I decided we were going to do a lot more sketch cards, I went and ordered these uh, from uh, a, a girl named Karen that Kevin and I know, and uh, but she makes amazing sketch cards. Almost all the professional card artists use them. But so I, these are, I think, 32 point or 36 point. So they're not as thick as the ones I was using, but they're still pretty, pretty thick. And I like, I personally like getting the ones with like the black or the blue core. Um, so, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I use those now as my go-to for most of my stuff. Um, this, this was actually funny um, because uh, this is a company that no longer exists, Inkworks. And so they would, they did this event one time at the 2007 San Diego Comic-Con where they had uh, myself and Tone Rodriguez uh, were signing autographs. And he and I were just like, what the, because most of that convention, we were sitting two aisles away in Artist Alley and never more, never more than like two to four people in line ever. And then we go do this autograph signing at Inkworks and the line is three hours long to, to get our autographs. And so we were just like, you know what, <laughs> let's compound the problem. So we started doing like, originally we were supposed to just sign and do like a quick like profile sketch on these, but he and I started doing like small little like masterpieces. Like we were going full blown. We were drawing Hellboy and aliens. Cause that was what they were going at the time. 
And that line got ridiculously long uh, because people saw what we were doing. And so people would get their one card, get a drawing, get back in line and get another one from a, of another character from the other artist because you got one or the other. So somebody I did a card for would get back in line and try to get one from Tone. Um, but I just remember that was uh, really cool because the convention ended and we still had this huge line. And so they're chasing people out of the building. So Tone and I were like, can we do this in the lobby? <laughs> <laughs> and Inkworks was like, are you serious? It's like, yeah, everybody who's still in line, if you have a card, get one now, just one card. And we will do one card for everybody who has one in the lobby right now. And I remember Tone and I packed up all our art supplies, went out in the lobby and for another hour, hour and a half after the convention closed and kept drawing cards for people um, out in the lobby of the convention center. And it was just so much fun. But he and I were both tripping out. Like, that was cool. That was insane. Like, that was the most ridiculous signing I've ever done. And so I kept a couple of the cards as a souvenir. Uh, uh, but it was just, it was really funny, though, because, again, for that entire convention, two aisles away, never more than, like, four people in line for, for a signature or a sketch or anything. And somehow he and I had this, like, you know, three to five hour line total. Uh, but yeah, I remember three hours because that's how long the signing was originally two hours and then they extended in an hour, uh, but then the convention center closed <laughs> and then we went out in the lobby and finished it. So it was, it was a lot of fun and, you know, bonus points to tone for actually doing that. Cause most, uh, most people I know would kind of be like, screw this, I'm out of here, you know? Um, and then these are, this is an AP card that sometimes when you get the, the sketch cards, something to remember is a lot of them are called APs and artist proof. Um, a true AP card comes from the artist. Uh, so keep that in mind. So I know like these cards here, there's actually an AP card uh, that's been, it's a foil emboss on these, this is uh, AP. There's only 50 of them, really cool, very rare, worth, you know, they're worth some money because of their limitation. They're not serial numbered or anything, unfortunately. But um, but they are limited to 50. But keep in mind, while they do, they are the artist's artwork, other than the artist doing the art, like most of us didn't even know we had these cards until the set came out. <laughs> Tops, you know, uh, the, the companies in general, not necessarily just Tops, but the companies in general sometimes don't tell us that they have a card and it's ready to go. So, um, and that they, they, or they included one of your cards in the set. So it was a lot of people were just shocked one day to see people cracking open, you know, watching the breakers break, uh, break open the museum collection. And uh, suddenly they're pulling out our cards and they're pulling out more than one of the same card. And so a lot of us were like, wait, what? No, that already got pulled. And it's like, no, it was the, it was the reprints, but, uh, and then the reprints have the AP on it. But again, the artist had nothing to do with those. So, whereas these, you know, uh, this one actually came, I'm trying to remember, was this upper deck? Skybox, sorry, oh, so the Skybox. So uh, this is actually a Skybox card. So I worked on this set years ago and I just didn't do, it is upper deck though. Um, upper deck company, Skybox. Yep. I they didn't know, Skybox, I totally yeah. forgot they bought them. I forgot about that. But, um, but yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I like that they actually stamp their APs. So um, is that the only, uh, Kevin's asking if that's the only card in the set that they printed of mine. Yes. Um, I will admit, again, I thought I did a great job on this set. I was very happy with the work I did, and I sent it in. And then as I've seen them breaking out some of the stuff, uh, some of the originals and things like that, holy bejesus. Like, some of those, the cards that those guys did were insane. And uh, and I definitely, uh, if they ever ask me back to do more, I will I will definitely, you know, step up my game significantly. Uh just because you know, if because if they're going to do these and send us these to sell, they, it's it's monetarily it becomes worth it. So between the return cards, you know, the AP cards that they, we get, and the uh, uh, getting the printed ones, that if you do a good enough card, they'll make a print of it. And some of the guys have four or five, you know, printed cards. So uh, because they did a much better job than I did. So if they you know, if you have those, that gives you more content to sell at the shows or kind of like what I said, I want to kind of remark this in some way. I want to embellish it or do something cool with it. And I haven't quite figured out what yet, but uh, I'll probably take one and just sacrifice it and see what happens. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's worthwhile to do more, to do a better job, 
knowing that you'll have more product to sell uh, later. So that's one of the other reasons why I try to do, when I do do a set, I try to do the best I can, because especially like with DC, with DCD it's easy because DCD pays much better. <laughs> so, See here I out. thought it was gonna be, oh, there's no stress. It's, you know, our well, that's, does that's, whatever they want. It's like, no, I just pay more. Yeah, there's, there's no, de- I was gonna say not, no deadlines, but the deadlines are fairly loose. They're kind of flexible. It's, they don't send us a card and say, okay, we need 50 cards and you've got 14 hours to do them because I've, I have received cards where they're like, Oh yeah, by the way, you know, uh, we just sent out your cards. They're due Tuesday or something. And I'm like, dude, it is Tuesday. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I, I literally have a week to do all these cards. Cause they'll, they'll send it and be like, yeah, you've got a week or two to finish it. And, and I got tired of that. That's why I, one of the reasons I stopped doing sketch cards for a lot of the companies. Um, uh, museum, they gave us so much time to work on the cards and I wasn't paying attention. I was so used to the crazy deadlines we usually get that I didn't realize in, in one of the emails I had where it actually stated the deadline, my, I turned my stuff in like two months early. <laughs> like they didn't give us weeks to do it. They gave us months. And I was kind of looking at that going, Ooh, I should have tried harder. Um, you know, again, wasn't wasn't significantly awesome pay for the man hours that go into it. But again, if you take into consideration, you know, getting the printed cards back uh, and the AP cards, and you know, also a lot of people don't think about the exposure. So I did the sports stuff because I've never done Major League Baseball before, and that's a whole audience I never broke into. Uh, so you know, sci-fi, fantasy, stuff like that. I got that covered. I've worked on Lord of the Rings. I work on Star Wars. Those are the two. You know kind of like major franchises if you're in on those you're golden um and so I, i've got those kind of locked down so people in the in that audience of sci-fi fantasy know who i am sports not so much and so you know it's, it's really funny though because i do have you know my cards is i'll sell these at the conventions my my ap cards i'll sell at the convention for like 500 dollars usually minimum um for my ap's you know 100 sometimes 50 dollars, but we'll say 50 to 300 for uh, uh, other cards, depending on what they are, what card stock, things like that. But um, so something like this, it's an officially approved Lucasfilm card stock, but it's super rare. Um, so something like that would probably be like 400 bucks, 500 bucks, if I fully painted it like these. Um, I'm not sure if I'd be able to do that with this just because the card stock's a little thin. So, but, uh, but I would try. <laughs> You know, whereas something like this fully painted, you know, you're talking like 100, 200 bucks, usually fully painted uh, at the maximum. So, so, so what you're saying is the people that buy uh, the products that have you in them from us are getting a substantial deal. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> because I, I, I can show you, I'll pull out some of my car. By the way, here's the very first card I ever oil painted. So uh, this is a... Uh, uh, Indiana Jones card that I did. One of the, one of the. This is actually the very first set I ever did for um, uh, Lucasfilm. But I hung on to these. I didn't want to sell them. Um, I re- I do remember at one point uh, when I first started this, I had an agent, and she saw how much these things were selling for on eBay. So she priced mine at nine hundred bucks each, <laughs> and that's like twenty years ago or something. Fifteen years ago, I forgot how long ago this set came out. What's the copyright on this? Two thousand eight. So yeah, like 15 years ago. So she priced these things at 900 bucks each. And I was just like, wow, really? <laughs> Needless to say, I still have them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so this is actually a, a regular Star Wars Galactic Files. And I just happen to really like it a lot. So it's at 300. And so some of these actually still have the price tags on them from Comic-Con. But uh, so this is not an AP card. It's just a regular card that was in the set. Um, that uh, I actually, I happened to buy, this is kind of one of the other weird things is I, I am, I found somebody who had a huge collection of my sketch cards and uh, I saw that he was starting to sell them off on eBay. And so I just flat out asked him how much for me to buy them. And he traded me original artwork. So I did one large piece and he sent me back a boatload of my own sketch cards. So, uh, which from a financial standpoint means I essentially quadrupled my money yeah. uh, for what I could get for the cards versus, you know, or what, even what he would have got if he piecemealed them off. 
But so like this one here, uh, you'll notice, actually also you'll notice I have some of my own stickers. These are not seal stick, like not like the perfect like tamper proof hologram stickers, but I do have these stickers I got made. Um, so this one actually says cozy art artist proof on it. So, uh, and they're green. And so the green ones are all the artist proof ones. And so you can see it's one of one AP cards. So, but, uh, uh, so the green ones are APs, the ones that are purple, which is my usual color is just an original art card. Nothing special about it. It's just original art. Um, and then this one also has the AP sticker on it as well. The green one, uh, but yeah, so that's so I kind of have them labeled like that so people can tell which one's which. So it flat out says artist proof. So, but they're little holographic stickers that I, I made. Um, then they sometimes they'll even do these, which are die cut. So you can see it's yeah. shaped like BB 8. And then, uh, so these are also really rare. I think these were, um, so something like, you know, the, the, the regular Star Wars card, regular uh, sketch cards were one per box. I think these were something like one per 20 boxes or something. K sets. Yeah, so I think it was a one per case hit. I don't quite remember. Um, and so that's obviously one of the more expensive ones. And then you also have this one, uh, which is again that Celebration Six uh, rare card stock one. So your uh, your 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 lights blacked out. That's kind of interesting. Oh, you know why? That's why. It's trying to white balance off that plastic. Ah. Thank you. Now, if somebody wanted to reach out to acquire some of your originals and APs, how do they find you and how do they get a hold of you? Um, they can actually just, uh, well, you can find me on Twitch and I can literally just show them the stuff live like we're doing now on Twitch. And so it's just K-O-H-S-E-A-R-T. So as long as you can spell my last name, Cozy. Um, this one's actually sold, uh, but that was, a, a, that was one of my, that was one that that one guy had. Uh, so not an AP card, just a regular card, but this one's, uh, uh, our good buddy car collector actually owns that one. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. And then, so this was kind of cool. So this is an artist proof card from Betty page. So I did a Betty page set years ago. So, I mean, it, it's kind of a, a big mix of all kinds of stuff. So you have, you know, here's my Lord of the, here's one of my Lord of the Rings APs that I still have. And then this one, if I remember correctly, if this one, if you stick it under a black, well, not a black light, if you stick this one in, in the, like, charge it under a light and then turn it in the dark, the sword actually glows because I used a little bit of glow-in-the-dark paint with that. Um, I'm not sure how well it works anymore, but. <laughs> uh, Paul has asked how long DCD has been going. Um, so technically it's been around for a little while. Uh, in a previous form, in 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 its current incarnation, uh, it'll be about a year in November. Um, I've been a part of the company for for just under a year, um, but the the company did was around before I was, um, and I was brought into the fold uh, when I became available. Um, but yeah, we we're still fairly new, but uh, we have a rabid following, as you can see, because uh, we're arguably the first company that's putting all original art in mystery box formats mm -hmm. uh, but letting you see what everything is uh, and kind of making the the mystery as which one am i going to get not whether or not i'm going to get original art so we're just a, a fun way oh. to get people to have original art in their house and i got a question from card collector he's asking which year was the skybox card so where did I put that one just now? Oh, it's right here. Oop, okay. So many cards all over my desk now. Um, this one is 2018, it looks like. Marvel Masterpieces. So I will tell you if you are not aware, Marvel Masterpieces are creme de la creme when it comes to Marvel collecting trading cards. Mm -hmm. um, Skybox is where you hear the precious metal gems. Everyone talks about those. Those are the... Uh, multicolored foil background cards that are now in the thousands of dollars. Um, that AP from that particular year is an extremely valuable card because it is a masterpiece and it has the Skybox logo on it. I should do a really good job on it, man. You should. I know I've got another AP also. It was from the Joe Jusco set. Like you can only do Joe Jusco 
uh, recreations. <laughs> yeah, that was the one where he signed all the boxes, like all 5,000 or 9,000 boxes. He signed every, and numbered every single one. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's one way to single-handedly devalue your own signature is flood the market with 9,000 of them. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> But uh, this is actually kind of, this is a good example. You're talking about the value of the cards people are getting in the DCD boxes. So this is actually a hundred dollar card. Does it look familiar? Uh, it looks like the aura sing that was in our set. It is. And so what happened was, is I painted this. I hadn't quite finished it. And then I lost it. Like I, I, we were in the middle of something and I had to move stuff and shift a bunch of stuff around and we were getting ready for a show. And it was a very hectic time. And then I went back to count all the cards and I realized the Aura Singh was missing. And I panicked, so I drew another one, which by the way, I like that one better. Um, <laughs> and then I, sh I packed it up and shipped it off. And then I found this one and I was like, oops, oh well. So I went ahead and finished it. Um, so it is, it is you know, very similar to the Aura Singh that was done because it is, you know, literally I took a photograph. I had a, uh, the reference and the photograph I'd wanted to use originally um so i sort of recreated the card just because it was you know again i had already drawn it and then lost it so technically this is the first one um i will admit i like the second one better but uh but yeah i these i sell for 100 bucks so um you know just just for the baseline ones and this is one that's very simplistic so if i'm going you know this one if i was to do it i would probably put it at 200 honestly for my for my own collection if i was to sell it outstanding so if, if that helps people set the value of what they're buying with the dcd stuff well i am going to spill just a little bit of beans um in that particular box art is not the only thing you're going to get um we have really jammed that with so we we uh, acquired some interesting things that we haven't announced yet but they're sitting over my shoulder off camera conveniently um, that is going to be, uh, an unbelievable value is the best way I can put it. I, I, for once, and you're going to, y'all are going to hate me. I actually had, oh, to I tell, hate you all the time. What do you mean once? <laughs> I had to tell uncle Doug and brother Trevor, Hey guys, let's pull back some stuff <laughs> on this one. <laughs> Because they were like, look at this. And I was like, there's no way we'll ever be able to do this again. You, we have to make it sustainable. And I was like, bear with me. Let's get this, this, and this. Let's remove some of this, but we'll add this. And they're like, okay, good compromise. Um, but when we announce it in full, um, you're going to be mind blown by what it is. And to know what it would have been if I didn't step in uh, would would make you would make you sick. <laughs> uh, would would probably make you at least be thankful, or at least your wallet. You'll hate us. You'll hate DC, but your yeah. wallet will love him. Because uh, the other thing we do have to think about is sometimes when we stick too much stuff in these boxes, they get expensive. And and that's exactly where I stepped in. I said, "Hey, I want to aim here," and they're like, "Oh, mm -hmm. but this could be one of the biggest things we've ever done." I'm like. All right, time out. <laughs> so I, I will admit one of the projects I was, I'm was i working on, so because uh, we can talk about this because I talk about it on my stream all the time. Yeah. I may actually save this for the robots one. I don't know. Maybe that'll be a cool one to stick in there. The robots totally, would be interesting. Totally forgot about that. But anyways, I'm doing a break based on robots, and so I just happen to be doing K2SO stuff. So, um, so this is one of the hits I'm doing for the robot set. But also I'm doing... Um, we're going to do a limited edition print uh, of, uh, of a robot and we're going to be doing some other stuff. So this will be the first time we do an artist spotlight that has original art, a print. The prints will have hits because there'll be, a, there'll be a, uh, uh, an unsigned edition or I'm sorry, they'll all be signed, but there'll be a, a uh, serialized and an unserialized edition. Uh, in that. And also there will be, um, uh, and I'm hoping if I, if I can, if I can have my way, which really does depend on time schedule and 
uh, you know, when VCD and I sit down and actually go through the actual budget for this, if I have my way, it'll actually be two, possibly three different prints. Um, and that way all of them will be serialized. <laughs> Um, but there'll be, you know, different versions or different types of, of prints. So there'll be three different uh, subjects, essentially, uh, within the robot category. So we're trying to work on that in a way so that the, the, the robots break when we do it will be a, uh, it will be a, a artist spotlight, but I, I really want it to be a super premium kind of item. So uh, it, it's kind of the goal. So we want to make sure it's got, you know, unique uh stuff in it but also uh stuff that goes really well like i i don't know would you would you actually because my, my biggest fear would be uh trevor boxing these two together <laughs> that like, is like i love trevor that's his bread and butter he's, <laughs> he's like let's put them together and i'm like but what if that person doesn't like k2so <laughs> i was like why don't you put uh you know a, a another well in this case like robot would be tough but let's say you know if we were doing like a rogue one type thing mm -hmm. hey why don't you put you know her with him <laughs> yeah but it was it, it, it would you know obviously with robots it would be hard but if i was doing a star a star wars uh thing i would definitely take like an andor card or something to put it with that yeah um, like that would be cool, you know, or a, uh, uh, you know, a Jyn Erso or something um, would be pretty cool with him. Um, but it's like, yeah, my, my fear with this is that to me, this is a really cool item. So I, I think it's hit level, but I wouldn't include it as a hit. I would just do it as goof, you know, because it's an experiment. I'm not sure how well it'll, you know, pan off or whatever. Um, and honestly, you know, and it is actually on authorized cards. So these were actually cards that are authorized by Lucasfilm, which kind of also leads to this, by the way. So this is a uh, uh, nowhere near as cool artwork because uh, this I did years ago, but it's also sat in my collection. Um, by the way, the reason I have so many of my own cards is because I don't put them out. Uh, you actually, literally, for years, you literally had to actually come up to me at a convention and say, do you have any of your APs? And I would pull out a box <laughs> and show them to you. I do not keep them out on display um, until Star Wars Celebration. I never had a way to display them safely. Um, so Celebration and Comic-Con, I actually managed to put them out on display. So only two shows. Um, but yeah, so this was actually the Tuscan invasion at WonderCon. So in 2013, um, uh, the 501st Legion has a group called the Crate Clan which are all Tuscan Raiders and, you know, uh, you know, denizens of Tatooine essentially. Uh, but they, uh, they did their own sketch card or they did their own card set. And then they also gave some of the artists who contributed sketches to that set were gifted uh, uh, some blanks to do whatever they want with. So I have those. So those, you know, that's another kind of cool thing where it's, is again, it's an authorized card uh, by the way, sponsored by Iconics, which is the same company that makes our sketch cards. Um, so for uh, my sketch cards and the DCD ones. But, uh, but yeah, so it's again, it goes to that whole thing about like, what is, is the card authorized? Is it just a personal sketch card? Is it an original piece of art? You know, is it printed? So a lot of that stuff kind of dictates. So, you know, here's a black and white piece. What do people think? I, I've always been wondering, like, because uh, I'm still waiting to hear on the 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 stuff I did for um, museum, the Topps Museum stuff, I did a lot of it in this style, in this black and white etched style to see how the sporting audience would respond to it. And, uh, you know, I got one person kind of cracked it up and was all like, huh, that's, that's neat. And then threw it to the side. <laughs> that's about the best reaction I got so far. A, a lot of breakers don't... <laughs> get it and i will say that that'll be my hot take they really don't because they're not looking for the sketch card they're worried about the you know the Aaron the rookie Judge the one of one the era. Yeah. auto like they're like oh cool yeah ink awesome the now one I'm of one jenna underwear. jameson's used underwear yeah 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 right exactly <laughs> sorry so, we were talking about bench warmers uh the other day <laughs> 
Yep, it's 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 one of the only <laughs> things I will not open. I can't believe that exists. Like I understand bench warmers. So when I was when I was working for you know magazines back in the day, you know we actually did projects with a lot of the models who were in bench warmers, but they weren't doing things like that. So you know it was just girls in bathing suits. Like that was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, and like back then it was like Carmen Electra was in there, and and you'd have you know mainstream models were doing it now you know, yeah no any of these people are yeah it's like the stuff that's in there now i was just kind of like tripping out over so yeah hence, hence the joke but anyways <laughs> uh but yeah the um uh uh but the the sketch card um you know it's it's not just the art it's also the back um i think also sometimes it's the 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 quality of the art on it in baseball you know it's also who you drew um, so I know that I did a bunch of vintage players and I've had a lot of, I've had some feedback on a couple of those where people would look at them and go, huh, why would he draw Yogi Berra? <laughs> you know, it's like, so, so like they're really disappointed. <laughs> so that I didn't draw like, you know, all trout or something, you know? Yeah. I, 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 um, I can't imagine uh, that you would do a bad job on those, considering some of the player pieces that we have here behind me. Um, I mean, it would it would almost behoove a company to come up with a like Mount Rushmore of of sports players uh, if they were really thinking ahead. That that would be a, a cool thing. And by the way, you shouldn't have said that because now my chat's totally gonna. I know somebody in one of our chats, anyways, is gonna ask about that. <laughs> Because that was announced before Comic Con, I don't know who announced it, but I think uh, I think Doug actually did. I think Doug actually said it. Yeah, we, they... we actually brought up the uh, the Babe Ruth and the Wayne Gretzky. Yeah, and uh, wanted to do it because uh, wanted to do the Mount Rushmore thing, but then that's been on hold because uh, of all the other projects we have lined up. Plus, also like right now, uh, my attention is on the Robots project as well as um the uh the richard garfield game stuff yeah so once i once i wrap the the grunt work on the richard garfield stuff then i can start focusing more on robots but the robots product really does have to be in the can before we start working on uh the the uh, mount rushmore stuff but also the mount rushmore stuff we still haven't like brainstormed like how that's going to work because it's it's much like the robots thing where we kind of want to try new stuff but we also want to, you know, how do I explain this? We want to do something that's super premium. Mm -hmm. So maybe not necessarily. Um, so we, we like, I love that DCD does stuff that's like, you know, $100. Um, I know we've talked about possibly doing like a $75 box at one point. Um, those are really hard to do with original art because you really do, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's you, the art alone sometimes costs more than that. So it's hard to do that, but I know that we've talked about possibly doing like a $75 box. I know that we do. So our, our average is usually a hundred to 250, but some of the stuff we've talked about is maybe doing like a premium element, something that's, that's, that's super awesome. and might be like a, a you know, a 500 plus dollar box. Um, that's They're... just mind blowingly amazing. But yeah. that is a hard product to, to put together, and it's a hard product to sell. So there is something that nobody knows about, and there's only four people watching, so the secret's going to be safe right now. Um, there is an ultra-premium getting-to-know Doug box. Doug uh, gathered a, a large collection of things that define him uh, and wants to put them into one big one-of-one -one box. There's only yeah. one available that's going to happen. Uh, and, and everything in there is going to have a, a little story behind it that he can tell when somebody purchases that, the story behind all of those things. Dude, I'm half tempted to buy that because Doug owns Andy Warhol pictures. He's trying to figure out what to do with it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> the redemption cards in there will be epic if he has them. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you there's art in there. I doubt there's a Warhol for <laughs> Okay, just, just checking. <laughs> for what he's doing. Um, but we're going to do a Trevor box and eventually a DC box as well. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So there is something that is going to be ultra premium that we've tossed around the idea of, but we have so many things coming out now uh, in the next three months that we were kind of shelving some of the bigger plans and going with the ones that are affordable that we want to get into people's hands first. Yeah. But um, do you know, I, I don't know, do you, we have a, a estimated price on what that is? Now you said that's a one box, like it's a one, one box. box project. So it's, it's a one off. Um, I don't know if he's decided what he's going to price that, but it's going to be okay. ultra premium. Literally yeah. it is like his, it's his stuff. <laughs> it is going to be like his stuff. Can, can I say the slogan I suggested for DCD collects and Doug laughed, but he's like, no, we can't use that. What? So cleaning out Doug's garage since 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the, the man has a collection that most people can't fathom. Yeah. So. Or they can fathom if you go to uh, Heritage Auction to scroll <laughs> through their next catalog. Just imagine at one point half that was Doug's. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doug's dead. Yeah. Uh, well, Lee, it is 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, just after 8 o'clock uh, Pacific. Um, so I'm going to call it a wrap, and I'm going to let you actually concentrate and be able to do some work. I got a little bit done, you know, an underpainting-ish. <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate you for, for stopping by and taking time out of your busy schedule. Not a problem. Um, Happy to help. Anything that you would like to say or any, uh, any shameless plug uh, you would like to give before I, uh, I, I end this stream? Uh, shameless plug. I would say, uh, watch my stream, uh, cozy art, uh, K O H S E A R T on, uh, Twitch here. Um, because especially on Fridays, I try to raid DCD collects, um, when, uh, when they start up their stream. Um, and I do have, you know, the, like I said, the robot project and several DCD collects projects coming out. Um, I know that once I get some breathing room, I have two personal projects I want to do, both of which will probably have a DCD collects tie-in of some sort um, that Doug and I have talked about. Uh, so that'll be that'll be cool. Uh, one of them is Kindergoth related. Uh, the other involves my black and white line art that everybody seems to dig. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but both of those will probably have some sort of a, a DCD collects uh, product tie-in of, at some point. And, um, and yeah, it's uh, uh, definitely just make sure you, you know, follow me on Instagram and uh, follow DCD collects on Instagram too. Cause like I said, lots, lots of cool stuff that we can only, you know, you've heard DC and I like giggling and, and you know, oh yeah, that thing that uh, Paul posted was like really cool. And then we didn't tell you anything about it. Uh, wait till you see the stuff that Paul and Kevin have cranked out for this new project coming out. It is gorgeous. Uh, wait till you see the dragons that are coming out because they are gorgeous. Uh, so, but beyond that, can't say anything else. <laughs> You've got to follow. <laughs> All right, man. Take care. I will. I will talk to you tomorrow, bud. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Um, so yeah, hanging out with Lee for a couple hours is always fun. Uh, he did allude to some of the things that, uh, are coming out. Uh, I can tell you dragons is right around the corner. The unconventional break is right around the corner. Um, I'm not going to be here next week, Thursday or Friday. I'll be in New York. Uh, I will be back on Saturday, uh, and we'll have hopefully some concrete dates, uh, for the arrivals of the first wave of the projects that are coming out. Uh, with that said, it is late. I love each and every one of you. I appreciate you hanging out with me on a Thursday when you could have been watching football. Uh, so thank you. I will see all of you tomorrow. So please take care of yourselves and each other so we can make that happen. Uh, take care. And as Kevin P. West said, buy more original art. <laughs> <laughs>